You're listening to Interactive Wrestling Radio, featuring the interactive interview, courtesy of WrestlingEpicenter.com. Welcome to another edition of the interactive interview here on WrestlingEpicenter.com, as we're now being joined by a New York Times best-selling author, Chris Jericho, joining us for the second time. Chris, are you there with us? That's two-time New York Times best-selling author. Get it right. There you go. Two-time best-selling author. Yeah, that's right. This new one also, uh, Undisputed, is also now a bestseller. Yeah, it made it to the uh, bestseller list on pre-sales alone, so that was pretty exciting just for the buzz and what people had heard about it. So kind of um, when you do something like this, a project this large and extensive, and that's the big goal, that's the holy grail is to make it onto the list. So to have it get on there so early uh, and know that it's going to be even higher this week is, is a good position. I'm excited. Absolutely, and that's got to be a great honor for you because I know that you guys, you yourself, sat down and wrote this entire thing from scratch. This is not like a ghostwriter. This was you doing this from yourself, correct? Yeah, exactly the same as, as Lion's Tale. I had a, a guy that I worked with as a collaborator, more of a, of a sounding board and you know somebody to get advice from and all that sort of thing, but every word that's been written in both of those books have been written by me, and I think you can tell that that's one of the reasons why people have enjoyed both of these books is that they can tell it, you know, it comes straight from straight from me and not from the pen of somebody who's just kind of transcribing different words and different thoughts. So, um, But like I said, it takes a long time and it's a big commitment to do that. So for everybody involved, not just me, everybody on the team, you know, to be on the, on the New York Times Best Service, it's, it's, a very, uh, it's a very prestigious thing. So to be able to do that twice is, 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 is um, quite the reward for sure. Very cool. And I think you'll be I've read it. What's that I again? Mean, he's been on there what two or three times? Uh, Foley. Who Foley? Yeah. Who was that? You got a midget in the studio or something? Who is that? <laughs> Let me introduce you. This is Patrick Kelly. He's our good friend from Maryland. He just has a little bit of a higher voice than uh, you and I. He's kind of popular. Right voice. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure Mick's been on the best show list probably four or five times at this point. I know that Mick's last book, Countdown to Lockdown, did not make the list though. So, as in the year 2010 or whatever, 2011, I definitely haven't beat. You do, and it's actually the same publisher. Yeah, yeah, Mick got signed um, after my book, and so did Brett. So Jericho's breaking down the doors, breaking down the walls, so to speak, at Grand Central Publishing, because after uh, Lion's Tale was signed, and they also signed Brett's book and then Mick's newest book. So. And, and your new book, for, the, for those who don't know, your new book is, is pretty much a look at your entire WWE run, because your last book left off kind of where you stepped in there, and this is kind of a look at the last decade ending with your re-debut in uh, 2007. Now, was it important to you to do this book outside of the realm of the WWE to make sure that you had any kind of creative control over it, or was that not anything that went into your thought process? Not something that went in my thought process for either book, because both of them are written outside of the WWE system, but the reason why I did that is, is frankly, they never asked me to write a book. Um, all the time that I was in the WWE, they never asked me to do that, and when I left in 2005, about two weeks after, I had a I had a literary ma uh, agent kind of scope me out and asked me if I was interested, and so originally it was going to be the whole story, and then I thought that I have so many stories and so much to tell that it'd be better to split them up into two or even three books, and I didn't have two deal, two book deal. I just had a one book deal, but the first one did so well that they signed the second one, which is perfect because I, I wrote the first one to be a direct, you know, precursor to Undisputed, and uh, that's the, like like you said, it, it 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 continues right where Lion's Tale left off and goes through uh, not my entire WWE career, kind of the first six years and a couple years beyond, and like you said, ends in 2007 when I returned um, with with Randy Orton and the Save Us promo. So. And that kind of leaves the door wide open for book number three, should I decide to, to do that. And, and that would be something that I think all of us would be interested in. And looking at this book, you know, you chronicle quite a bit about the many facets of Chris Jericho. You're not just a wrestler, as many people try to, you know, pigeonhole people. You know, one of the things that I'm a big fan of yours for is Fozzie and uh, the band Fozzie. And, you know, I got a couple questions to ask based on uh, something that Eddie Trunk said, but I'm not going to pry too much. But I do want to ask a little bit about Fozzie. Uh, I wanted to praise you on your last effort. I thought that was a great record. I thought that putting the ballad on there really threw me for a loop, and I enjoyed that. Um, but I just wanted to ask you, you know, what's the next step for Fozzie, and what can we expect to well, see from Fozzie in the year 2011? I mean, that's one of the things that uh, Undisputed does deal a lot with, with getting Fozzie off the ground and, and kind of bringing the band through the ranks the same way that I did for myself in wrestling 10 years prior. So it is kind of an interesting dichotomy when you see, you know, Jericho's 
working in front of 15,000 people at Madison Square Garden one night and then working at, you know, the Tribeca Rock Club the next night in front of dozens with his band, but having the same amount of passion for both. Because when I was a kid, I had two dreams. I wanted to be a wrestler and I wanted to be uh, in a rock and roll band. Right. And I always uh, focused my life on both of those things. And it just so happened that wrestling took off first. I mean, I've been a musician since I was 14 years old, way, way longer than I've been wrestling, but I think a lot of people don't really know that. And so when when wrestling first started, I, I didn't, I was still writing songs and recording demos and playing gigs and all that sort of thing. So it wasn't something I ever stopped doing. And then when we had the chance to get Fozzie going in 99, it was kind of like another dream coming true, especially now in 2011 with all the, all the you know, the momentum that we've that we've gotten, especially over the last two or three years, it's really gone over the top with all the different things we've been doing, all the gigs we've been playing, all the countries. And um, So I wanted to write about that in Undisputed because I'm not just a wrestler. I never have really thought of myself as that. I've always thought of myself more of a, as an entertainer and as a as a showman than, than actually just a wrestler. And that's why I was able to make it in wrestling even as uh, you know even when I did because it, back in those days it was always about bigger guys who was right. six foot eight three hundred pounds and I could never be that big but I knew I could have the biggest personality and the biggest charisma and go that that route and uh, that's the way I was focused on so um, I mean we we Chase the Grail was was huge for us um, since I left the WWE in September I've been to England Ireland Scotland Wales Australia France Canada. Um, so it's like I've been quite a few places just with the band, with Fozzie. And so we're going to start working on a new record right now. And then awesome. we're doing all the festivals this summer overseas in Europe, which is a big tradition. Oh, yeah. Still waiting for uh, a couple of the really big ones to come through. And that's kind of what my big announcement is focused on. Although people have different thoughts and feelings over what the big <laughs> announcement is going to be. But that's basically it. I wish I could give the big announcement right now, but we're still waiting for it to be you know, sign on the dotted line so I can say what it is, but it has to deal more with what Foz is going to do. I kind of figured that. Everybody jumped on it being a wrestling thing, but I figured when Eddie Trunk posted it that it would be something that it had to do with music because I know that he's, you know, he's your buddy, but he's also, you know, Mr. He's the uh, the cousin Brucey of heavy metal, so. Yeah, well, I mean, just the fact that you know who, who cousin Brucey is puts you in the in the nerd category, by the way. Um, <laughs> well, <but> yeah. <laughs> did you know, Chris? <laughs> but there, there's a lot of different... I mean, I always have a lot of projects going on. That's I think it makes you know it makes people mad. It makes wrestling fans mad. I mean, I'm on this book tour right now, and it's been very long and very extensive. Uh, I'm in Los Angeles right now, but I just flew in from um, Dallas this morning, and I was in Phoenix the day before that, and I was having a debate with someone who was convinced that this was about five o'clock in the afternoon Phoenix time. Yeah. Uh, he was convinced that Vince had a, a plane waiting for me to jump into to fly directly to Oakland to make the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view to be the, the sixth man in the in the SmackDown Chamber. And I was like, it's it's physically impossible. Like you can't get there in time. I mean, it's probably about a two-hour flight from Phoenix, a three-hour flight. The show starts like in 45 minutes, and I'm still here with you know 100 people left in line. There's no way I can make it. No, I know you're going to make it. I know you're going to make it. It's like what am I Captain Kirk? I'm going to transport there. <laughs> but I think that makes people mad because in this day and age people want all the answers uh, at their fingertips. They want to be able to hit a couple buttons on a keyboard and then you know get all the answers and when they don't uh are not able to do that it makes them mad and the fact that it's like oh, Jericho why aren't you coming back? When are you coming back? You're coming back at the Rumble. You're coming back for 221. You're coming back for WrestleMania. And it's like I'm not. It's not going to happen uh you know at this point. But I think um that makes people angry but but the other side of the coin is I'm always doing stuff that's quality and it's always I never put myself in a box of who I am as a as a performer as an entertainer. So if it's got Chris Jericho's name or if I'm involved, you know it's going to be 100% I'm going to do everything I can to make it kick ass. Very cool. And i, I got to give you credit for something here, Chris. I have never been pissed off at a wrestling product in years. I haven't been a mark in years. Well, I guess I'm a mark, but, you know, I've never been uh, let myself get riled up than when I did when you did your Legends takedown gimmick a few years ago. And I do have to ask you, since you mentioned a few seconds ago that you weren't the biggest and the guy that kind of inspired you to get in there was, was Ricky Steamboat, how cool was it to finally have the opportunity to wrestle the Dragon? Oh, it was good. Um I mean, he wasn't the number one reason. There was a couple of the guys. I mean, Shawn Michaels and Owen Hart were just as responsible as Ricky was. But I, um, it was interesting because I had to go to Vince to get Ricky into the match because originally he wanted, uh, who was in it, Snooker, Piper, and Valentine because Vince's criteria was that you had to be uh, in the WWE Hall of Fame and you had to have worked on WrestleMania 1 because it was the 25th anniversary of WrestleMania. Oh, okay. And um, I was like, well, 
Yankees. I mean, you know, no offense to anybody, but if it's Snooker, Piper, and Valentine, it's going to be, you know, a tough match for sure. I mean, what what am I going to do? So I thought, you know, Steamboat or Lawler would be way better, and then Lawler didn't fit because he wasn't at the first WrestleMania, but Steamboat was perfect. And, you yeah, know, Vince Steamboat. thought about it, and I know there was a little bit of discussion because I think there was a problem at the time with uh, Steamboat's wife owning the name and all this sort of stuff, but uh, but he, you know, Vince agreed to it. So at that point, it was like you know, there was no real marking out or anything like that. It was just a business thing where it's like, oh, thank God, I have somebody that I can do some stuff with. And I think Ricky did a great job. He really uh, opened some eyes. And then we had a couple other matches after that. One of them in Japan, and one of them in Greenville, South Carolina, that I think were really really good matches. That were two of my favorites that I've had. So yeah, he came back, uh, you know better than 80% of the roster pretty much and just you know that's just when you're a natural talent like that that's how it, that's how it is very cool very cool awesome well I wanted to go back to something that you said earlier about um, wrestling fans being a little upset about you venturing in outside to other uh, ventures very similar to The Rock who just recently came back I, and I remember when he first left he experienced a lot of backlash from the wrestling fan base is that something that you've had to deal with uh, in going back and forth because I don't personally as a wrestling fan I've never minded well, I mean, I don't know if Rock really suffered backlash, but I think we're, if there was any backlash that Rock had, it's when he kind of, you know, went from Rock to Dwayne Johnson and didn't really talk about wrestling or ever really associate himself with the WWE. And I think that's one of the reasons why he came back because he realized like I'm just alienating this huge fan base for myself for no reason. Um, mm-hmm. and for me, it's like I've never been any other way. I mean, I've always done other things, and, and the band has been around for as long as, you know, when I walked into the doors of the right. WWE in 1999, I already played a couple of shows with Fozzie at that point, and I left in 2005 to do right. more stuff with Fozzie and to study acting and to write a book, and um, so, I mean, it's part of, like I said, it's part of who I am, and, you know, it, wrestling fans, uh, they might be mad, uh, but I think deep down inside, they know that, you know, I'm still doing quality stuff, and then if they are mad, it's like, I really don't care, because it's my life, and I've never... I always look forward, never backward. And I always look for the challenge and look for things that I think are going to, uh, you know, um, make me a, a more rounded performer in person. And um, it's the same thing as, you know, Neil Peart going to Africa to study tribal rhythms with, you know, witch doctor drummers. It's like, well, that's not rock and roll. Well, it is because when he comes back to rock and roll, he's that much better of a player. So there you go. all these things, especially right. when I left in 2005, to go study acting and to go work with the Groundlings, uh, and do all the, you know, the improv comedy and all the stuff that I did. When I came back in 2007, I mean, you couldn't even touch what I was doing in 2007 with 2005. I mean, it was a completely different performer, completely different character for sure. Now, like I said before, the book that, that just came out, Undisputed, takes a further look at, I think, where the majority of people discovered your, your talents. I mean, obviously, a lot of us have been fans since your Japan stuff and, and ECW and WCW, but this was more a chance for where the mainstream public got a chance to see it and Basically, do you think that more people will be more receptive to this book, given the fact that you're going to be talking about occurrences that they're more familiar with with you, in, instead of kind of just finding out the background of you? Well, I, I've kind of received six of one, half dozen of another on those. I think a lot of people liked the first book because it was so unknown. But I think, you know, those are more of the hardcore fans. I think the the, the greater majority likes Undisputed better because it does deal with characters that they know and, you know, matches that they've seen or have heard of, uh, you know, and it's a little bit more current, too. It deals from 99 to 2007, which is a lot easier for people to remember or to kind of um, adjust to rather than 1990 to 1999, which was, you know, 10, 15 years after the fact. So I, I think that... Um, you know, not, like I said, just just looking at the at the reviews and then the, the you know the, the sales and, and just the critical claim and the buzz. I mean, the buzz is so much bigger. And also, too, I think for the first book, people didn't really know what they were going to get with the Jericho book, but but then they saw my writing style and they really uh, kind of related to it. And I think that's kind of made undisputed a bigger buzzer off the bat. And, and plus, too, I write very honestly. You know, I'm not afraid to to talk about myself if I think I did something bad or, or something didn't work out the way that it should have or that it right. could have. You and are kind I, of your own worst critic in this book, yeah. Well, I always am. So that I maybe maybe even a little bit too stiff, but I don't mind. I mean, that's just how I am. And once again, I, I write what I feel. I don't try and pull any punches with it. So, um, And that's I think that's something else that translates really well because a lot of uh, you know, people who write stories about themselves don't talk about the bad things or they kind of gloss over them or they were never in the wrong. Like, I was in the wrong lots, just as everybody is. So I think people can relate to that, too. 
All righty. I have only a few more questions for you because I know you only have a few minutes left for us. Uh, but I did want to ask you, I know when you get on stage and, you know, you talked a little bit earlier about getting on stage in front of fewer people when you're in your band. And, you know, a perfect example of that was WrestleMania out here in Phoenix. You played Club Red, which is a band, a venue that I go to quite often, uh, which is a very small venue. And then, of course, playing the University of Phoenix Stadium, which is just ginormous. I mean, it's got to be, a, uh, you know, a great adjustment period for you there. But um, is it – Well, not necessarily because, I mean, the thing is with the Club Red show, it was sold out. So there was like 750 people in there. So, I mean, it, it, when you get a, a sellout is a sellout, you know what I mean? And like I said, to have the passion for both of these things and, – and WrestleMania is not Chris Jericho. WrestleMania is a bunch of different factors and, and focuses. But for that – Night in Club Red, Fozzie sold out that club, and, and that to me is the same buzz. It's not more of a buzz than seventy thousand people for WrestleMania because that I'm just a cog in the machine. Fozzie, it's my band, it's my name on the line, and so when you do a show like that that does sell out, it, it makes it even more gratifying. I think. So continue your question, though. Sure. sure. It was more along the lines of your performance when you played the more heel character. You kind of toned down everything that we that was known as Chris Jericho previously. You were more tame. You were more calm you were more reserved you, you're more, almost monotone in some f- senses you know was that a more difficult character for you to be or were you, you know, itching to bust out or no uh, not at all I, I, I was the character that i created um to be the exact opposite of y2j because i wanted people to understand that i wasn't messing around it was a completely different character it was a different time and it was a different place and um, that was you know i created that character i lived that character and it worked so well that you know 60% of the heels in the WWE now do that exact same character. So uh, I think that, um, you know, when you want to subtly let people know that you're serious, you don't do the same old things that you did before. And that's one thing I always hated when guys turn from heel to babyface and they come out and they look exactly the same and they talk exactly the same. It's like, well, what's, what's the difference? Hmm. You know, and I think uh, if and when the time comes for me to return, I'll have to totally reinvent that character again and not do the same thing that we've seen um you know, over the last three years or even now when a lot of guys are kind of taking, um, you know, taking parts of that for their own character. So, like I said, I'm all about the future. I never look back to the past, ever. Um, and if I do look back to the past, it's only to get ideas for the future. And that's what I've always built my entire career on. That's what i built my life on. Awesome. Well, I will let you go in just a sec. Just final question is uh, where can people find out more information on the book tour to perhaps get their copy of Undisputed Signed? Well, it's almost done. I, I've got a couple more show, uh, signings out in L.A., then I go to Florida, then I go up to Toronto, and then I'm done. But as always, it's uh, ChrisJericho.com or I am Jericho on Twitter, and that's where you'll find all of the up-to-date news on everything that Jericho's doing. Very cool, man. Well, i got to tell you, I'm a big fan of, of course, wrestling through the years and, of course, being a big heavy metal fan, you branching into that and becoming so unique and, and becoming your own entity instead of just a covers band has really been a uh, a journey for me as a fan. So I want to thank you for both of those and thank you for giving us uh, so much of your time today. Thanks, man. See you guys.